attendees, we have Jonathan Young and his talk, Deep Dive into Elixir. Jonathan, the broadcast now belongs to you. Okay. Hey, everyone. I uh, you know, wish I saw everyone's faces. I want to say, like, how's everyone's day doing? But obviously, I have no idea. I can't tell if everyone's day is going well, but I hope it is. Um, so my name is Jonathan Young, and today I want to do a deep dive into Elixir. Well, I guess really just one abstraction, because I think if I did a deep dive into all of Elixir, we would be here for hours and no one's got time for that. So before I kind of dive in this talk, I want to give a bit of background about you know why I'm doing this and a little bit about who I am. So, okay. So first of all, I'm super excited to be here. You know, I'm, I've been a Ruby developer for years and in the last two months, I've started learning Elixir as a side project and already I'm just loving learning Elixir, right? I kind of wish that I could stop writing Ruby code at work and just switch to Elixir. So in my mind, I'm trying to come up with like, you know, ways to pitch switching everything to Elixir. And one of the reasons I love Elixir is the abstractions and kind of like the developer happiness around writing Elixir applications. I think to me, the abstractions are great when I'm first learning something new because I can get hands on and build things without really needing to get into the details of how like everything kind of works underneath the hood, um, you know, at least not until you know, I use it in production or something like that. And one of my favorite abstractions is the pipe operator. Now, I'm sure a lot of you already know what this is, but coming from Ruby, um, when I saw this, my mind was like totally blown because I try to avoid nested functions like the plate because let's face it, it's not the easiest thing to actually read. Um, in Ruby, I would write a million different variables to try, to try and avoid nested functions, but with Elixir, with the pipe operator, I can just have a nice little chain of things and everything looks pretty and uh, I can totally see what's going on. But I didn't want to take this abstraction at face value. You know, uh, a lot of stuff that I do when I'm learning is just to use it and then move on. Um, with me learning Elixir, I really wanted to dive into the guts of the pipe operator. And that's what I want to do a deep dive about. So I started where a lot of like developers would start and that's with documentation. The documentation is great. And it states that this operator introduces the expression on the left-hand side as a first argument to the function call on the right-hand side. So maybe not news to some, but for me, this is, uh, this made total sense. And this is like a very simple way to do it. And in fact, other languages also have similar things. So for example, Clojure has the threading macros and even JavaScript is proposing to introduce the pipeline operator into its language. And in that JavaScript readme, um, you know, it mentions like F sharp has it, Elm, Julia, all these other languages have the pipeline operator. In fact, Ruby kind of had the pipeline operator, but not really. Like I did a little bit of research into it. I found this dev two post that was really talking about the pipeline operator being like a dot um, method alias. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that's still in there and it makes me kind of sad, but you know what? We'll just move on and let's just see the Elixir operator in action. So we have a nested function. We take a string, reverse it and downcase it and we get the hello world. Now looking at it, it's not like the easiest thing to read. It's not terribly hard to read, but you can imagine if we start nesting a lot of functions, then you know, it becomes harder and harder to maintain and to read. Now with Elixir, we can use this pretty pipe operator to kind of split this nested function into a chain of operations. So here we take the hello world string, we put it into the reverse function and the result of that expression gets put into the downcase function. And now we've written our hello world program with a pipeline operator. But how does this actually work though? Because right now, this is what's going through my head. Pipeline something nested function. Okay, cool. So all of this magic that's happening um, is kind of what I want to start you know, uh, getting into and start dispelling. So this uh, talk has three questions I want to answer. First, how is the pipeline operator actually defined? Where does it specify the position of the argument? So in the documentation, it always said the first position. Um, you know, where is that in the code? Is that like hard coded in the code? Um, and why does it have to be the first position? Can it be any other position? And then I think the crux of the problem, and this is kind of like the big fish that we need to fry, is how does the nest slash call the functions in the pipeline? So how does it turn kind of this, the pretty chain of operations, this kind of pipeline into that nested function call? So let's go down the rabbit hole together. Now, 
the documentation points me to a piece of source code and this is it. So this macro key kind of defines our pipeline operator. And it's pretty small, right? It's like one, two, three, four, there's like five lines to this. And when I first saw this macro, I was like, great, I can totally understand this in a matter of hours. And then I looked a little bit closer and realized that I have no idea what was going on. Because remember, I only have like two months of lecture experience and as a side project. So let's kind of step through this macro together and kind of take things step by step. So the very first call, def macro, left, operator, right. I should probably talk about macros a little bit. So Nicholas gave a talk yesterday on metaprogramming that goes into way more detail than I'm going to go into. Um, and it was awesome and I learned a lot. I would definitely suggest to go watch it. Um, but simply put, macros will take in a representation of code and then you can transform it or generate new code and the output is another representation of code. So everything gets done during compile time as well, which is really cool because we have something called quotes and we can't really talk about macros without talking about quotes. Essentially a quote is how an Elixir expression is represented. So when I say a representation of code, I mean like a quote or query expression. So macros take and return query expressions, like I said, and here's what one of these look like. So let's kind of step through these like things. So uh, we can use this kind of special keyword quote here and apply it on like a simple data type, for example, like a string or an atom or an integer, and it returns that data type. But what's more interesting is if we take an expression, like say one plus one, and we apply a quote on that, we get back a tuple. And this is kind of our quote expression. And you may have also had this as an abstract syntax tree. Now this tuple has three elements. The first is a function name. The second is a um, keyword list containing some metadata. And the third is the argument list. What's kind of interesting is if we kind of start quoting other functions that have um, variables, right? So if we quote div A and B, we get like a representation of what that um, div looks like within Elixir. So again, it's another tuple, but instead of A and B in the argument list, well, the argument list actually contains more quotes. And these quotes are actually assuming that A and B are functions. And what's really cool about this is, you know, we haven't defined what A and B is and nothing blew up because all we're doing is kind of passing representation of data into our macro. But how do we actually change that? And how do we inject code, right? And that's where unquoting comes in. Now let's just jump straight into a code example. Um, we have two variables, A equals 10, B equals two. You know, we want to use that div AB example from before. And let's just quote, uh, this div A and B. Well, this doesn't return what I would expect, right? I would expect that div to now have the 10 and two inside the query expression, but it doesn't. Well, that's where unquoting comes in. So unquoting is kind of like the string interpolation thing where we can um, inject the values of A and the value of B into our query expression. And the resulting expression contains our 10 and two. So this is great. We have a representation of data. We also have a way to kind of alter that data, but what happens when we actually want to evaluate it? Well, evaluating a quote, let's have a look at Alexa's code.evalQuoted function. So this is great. Alexa kind of gives you ways to do this already. So we can um, run this on a query expression and it will return a tuple containing two elements this time. So the first one is the like the result of that expression. So 10 divided by two is five. And then the second element in that tuple is any variables assigned. So uh, obviously the unquote A, unquote B, there's no variables being assigned for that one. But let's take an example where we quote A equals one. Um, we see the result of that expression is one and the variable assigned is A. Now let's try and quote the div A and B without doing the unquote. And that's when we get our compiler, right? Because A and B, remember, were functions and we haven't actually defined what those functions are. And now our program kind of just blows up. So now that we have this idea of like quoting, unquoting and this code eval um, to actually kind of evaluate the quotes, remember that our pipeline operator didn't actually have any of those keywords. So what's actually happening there? Well, we know that everything coming in and out of this macro is going to be a query expression, but I know for you and me, like if we start getting to larger expressions, it's going to be harder and harder to actually figure out what's going on with that quote. Alexa solves that problem as well with macro to string. 
And MapJS toString gives us a textual representation of what's going on. So we can take this like one plus one quote and it returns a like one plus one string. Pretty simple. Um, and then if we take this kind of uh, more complicated quote where we have the unquote, uh, we do div A and B, it returns us the div uh, 10 to string, which is awesome. And that makes like life so much easier when I'm trying to like debug what is going on with the pipeline operator. So let's kind of do a quick recap of everything we just uh, you know, learned about macros, I talked a lot. Uh, so big takeaway one, number one is macros take quoted expressions, um, aka abstract syntax tree, um, aka a representation of data. Macros return quoted expressions. So in kind of like uh, that middle section, macros can um, alter that quoted expression and return something new or do whatever it wants. And also macros are evaluated during compile time. So let's try and figure out what's actually coming into our pipeline operator function. And that's, you know, we have this left operator right keyword here. So looking at a code example, the left is everything to the left of the last pipeline. So here it's a quoted expression and that expression contains the hello world string and the string.reverse function. And then the right variable is just the very last element, the string.down case. So what happens if we quote this you know, exact same pipeline string? Well, something's kind of interesting, right? So if we quote this, then we see in that argument list, the very first element of the argument list is the left side that we saw before. And then the second element of that argument list is the right side. So that's super cool. And I think with that, we can like happily tick off the very first question, how is the pipeline defined, right? It's a macro and the macro takes in query expressions and these query expressions are kind of like the left side and the right side, the left being, you know, potentially like a list or many expressions and the right just being one expression. But where does it actually specify the position of the argument? So that's kind of like the next question that we need to answer. Well, looking back at our pipe operator function, I know about you, but I don't really see any numbers in this. Um, I noticed that macro pipe actually has like a position variable, but you know, we don't really know what that position is or like how it's being defined. And the answer lies in the very next line, macro unpipe. So looking at this macro unpipe function, we have a quoted expression um, where we kind of take the left and the right side, uh, well, sorry, left and the right variables and pass it into this function. And this gets passed down this kind of like trio functions because pattern matching and Elixir is awesome. And we end up calling the very last line. So this very last function unpipe um, assigns this number zero to the expression and puts that as like a tuple into a list. So let's just make this a little bit more concrete and give a code example. So here we are macro, uh, calling macro unpipe on this kind of pipeline query expression. Um, and this returns a list of tuples. And inside each of those tuples is um, the value, either 100 or another query expression, like the div5 or the div2, and then a zero. And in the Elixir source code, there's actually documentation on what that zero is. And essentially that zero defines a position. But we don't really know how it works just yet. We'll find out a little bit later, but I think for now, let's just take off the second question because I really like taking things off. Um, so done, where's the specified position of the argument? Uh, we know it's like kind of in the macro unpipe. We know a number exists in the macro unpipe and it's being kind of returned back as like a list of tuples with an expression and a position. So let's just tackle the big fish. How does an S slash call functions in the pipeline? This is kind of like the fun, the fun stuff. Um, now that is, that answer to that question is the rest of the macro. So let's have a look at this macro pipe function. So macro pipe isn't being called yet. It's just being assigned to a function. Uh, oh, sorry, it's being assigned to a variable. And that macro pipe function looks a little bit like this. Now, obviously there's other uh, ver versions of it and we can kind of just skip over all the validations and look at the very last line. So what's happening with this is it will take um, your expression, your position, assuming it's whatever, zero potentially, and inserting that expression into the argument list of that position. So if we were to use, um, you know, the macro unpipe variables that we're getting out, um, sorry, the, the uh, result of the macro unpipe function, 
into the macro pipe call, we can see that it's doing something like taking the 100 and inserting that into the first position of the div five argument list. So this is really cool, right? Because we starting to get into this like nesting a little bit and we can start chaining this expression into another query expression, right? We take the div 105 now and we can insert that into the first position of the div two argument list. So now we're getting really close. Like I could feel it in my fingers. I could feel it in my toes. You have a song goes. But that function isn't being called just yet. Remember, we were just assigning that to a variable. So where do we actually call that? Well, that's with this function, list.foldl. And list.foldl will take in three arguments, uh, fun, ht. Now, when I first saw this, I was like, Adam, what are you doing here? Like, this made no sense to me. Um, learning Alexa, Adams to me did not have function calls like this. After like a very short amount of Googling, I realized that, oh, this is Erlang. This is the thing that Alexa is built on top of. And in fact, you can kind of like look through Alexa source code and see Erlang being called everywhere. So, uh, you know, here's just a couple of like function examples. So this is Alexa's subtraction operator, list flatten, and file make directory uh, method. And all of these are kind of calling down to Erlang, which is really cool. And in fact, you can even look at uh, more information about this Erlang call, right? Using the IEX I function. And if we pass in lists, we get this raw representation, which is um, a cool kind of like Adam with the list kind of keyword here. And then we also have reference modules. So we know that this list is a module and also an Adam, but you know, modules are kind of like the keyword here. Because if we compare this just to say a normal Adam, like hello, then we won't get like nearly as much information from this. So here, if we use the I function on hello, we just get back a data type of Adam and we just get back like a, a reference module of Adam. So nothing too crazy. So this brings us back to like Erlang OTP. Now, I know Erlang is a functional programming language and I know it has like built-in support for concurrency, distribution, fault tolerance, you know, all the good stuff that Alex is based on. And um, Alexa kind of gives it this nice little shine, you know, it makes um, writing Erlang code kind of feel a little bit like Ruby. So it gives a nice little abstraction layer. And Alexa also adds like some more functionality to Erlang's calls, right? So like, for example, macros and like metaprogramming Alexa, um, I would say are better than the same thing in Erlang, or at least from what I've read. But what is OTP? <laughs> so um, this is still kind of like something I'm still learning and still investigating here, but what OTP stands for is Open Telecom Platform. And it's a set of Erlang libraries and design principles that provide middleware to develop systems. In other words, it's just like a grouping of best practices and modules to build applications. And you can think of Elixir as an Erlang OTP application. In fact, if you dive into kind of like the Elixir source folder, we have a bunch of Erlang files. And at the very top, we have this elixir.app.src, which kind of helps us you know, which defines that Alex OTP application. So this was kind of like a little brief aside and we kind of gone on a really long tangent from the pipeline operator. So let's get back to it. Now we know list.foldl is an Erlang call. So opening up the Erlang documentation, we get this function definition. So foldl will take in a function, an accumulator and a list and returns a new accumulator. So here's a concrete code example. We take function, it's a summing function. We have an accumulator zero and then a list of one, two, three, four, five. And you guessed it, we are just summing each of those numbers in that list. Nothing too crazy there. It's, you can think of it as like reducing over that list. Um, in fact, this is reducing particularly from left to right. There's also a fold R which goes the other way, um, but obviously we're using fold L in our pipeline. So what actually comes into this fold L function in our pipeline operator. Well, again, we pass in the fun H and T. The fun variable is macro pipe. H and T come from macro unpipe, H just being the very first element and T being the rest of that tuples list. So let's bring this all together. We have a pipeline, 100 divided by five divided by two. And a lot of this code I've just kind of pulled from like the Elixir um, source code because yeah, it's really simple and it makes a lot of sense. 
And then we run macro unpy on this pipeline. And that returns us a list of tuples. And that list of tuples contains an expression or an element like 100 or a query expression like div 5, and then a zero or a, that will be used as a position. Next, we declare a variable macro pipe that will call a function macro pipe. And now we actually use that function with list.foldl, and we apply that function on each element of that list. And what happens is we take, you know, we take the accumulator, the 100, and we put that into the first position of the argument list in div 5, and we do the same thing with div 2. Now, we saw this code a little bit before, so won't go into it a bit more. And we get this kind of nested quoted expression where we have kind of modified the argument list to contain something completely different. Now, for all intents and purposes, the macro is like done with its job, right? It's going to take this and pass it on to um, whoever is going to be calling it or whatever. But for you and me, like, what does this actually look like? Like, is this really a nested function call? Well, macro to string comes to the rescue again. We can run macro to string on this if we get back this textual representation, which is a beautiful kind of beautiful nested function call. So there we have it. The very last question, how do we nest slash call functions in the pipeline? I think that is a check. In my mind, it makes sense. We take in query expressions into our macro pipe operator. We split those expressions out using macro unpipe and assign each of those a position zero. And then using fold L with the macro pipe function, we kind of combine everything back together again and continually insert like the previous element into the first position of the next element's argument list. So this is great, but why did I do this again? <laughs> so at the end of the day, I don't think uh, I'm able to write better Elixir code. I don't think I'm any faster at writing Elixir code. And in fact, this kind of brought up way more questions and a lot more things that I need to learn about Elixir than I had when I first started this journey. I think there are kind of big three big takeaways from this. So one, it's to get a better understanding of how things work, right? Going through this process, I kind of learned a little bit more about how macros work, um, learned a bit more about how Erlang is being used in Elixir, and even learned like stuff about query expressions and unquoting and all this other stuff. So it's been a great journey to learn a few new keywords that I know I can use to like be better at learning Elixir in the future. And another big aspect or another big key takeaway is it dispels the magic of abstractions. So when an abstraction works and when it works well, it is like magic, right? It's, you know, butterflies and rainbows and everything's going great. And you're writing really productive code. But then as soon as you kind of step outside that abstraction or say you want to do something that the abstraction doesn't offer or it breaks, you kind of left in a really tough spot, right? Like you don't really know what's going on. And kind of going through this process helped me dispel the abstraction of the pipeline operator. For example, you know, I really wanted to know why it's always the first position. And going through the code, well, now we know because it's hardcoded, right? It's always going to be zero. And that position is defined in the macro on pipe function. Well, now when a library comes along and there's a library called Magrit, if I'm saying that right, um, well, Magrit will actually use an ellipsis to determine what position your argument should go in. So if we look at some, uh, like some of the source code from Magritte, um, you can see here the two is being piped into uh, an integer two string, but instead of being piped into the first position, it's now being piped into whatever position the ellipsis is in, which is really cool. Um, so how does that actually work? Well, we talked about macro unpipe and the macro unpipe call will now kind of dynamically determine what that position is. So this is great. That magic of like how this abstraction works is totally dispelled. I know exactly how it works and you know, I can work within its boundaries. And I think the final takeaway from this is to scratch that itch, right? I think as a developer, you get a chance every day to learn something new, um, but working with you know, customers and client code and trying to fix production issues and meet custom commits, um, like sometimes that, that feeling of like learning and, and being curious gets lost in like the routine of like day-to-day -day, um, fighting fires and, and writing code. But I think um, 
being new to Elixir and being like able to use this as a side project, I've had that time to like be curious and really spend some time learning and going through the Elixir code base and going through the documentation and the community itself, everything is awesome, right? Like everyone's super nice. The documentation is really easy to read. Even the source code itself, a lot of it is just written with Elixir and it just has great comments. So I would say like, if you're kind of new to this and you're learning something new about Elixir, um, don't be afraid to just dive into the source code. So with that, that is all I have for you guys today. Um, thank you so much for attending my talk. Um, it's my first one, so hopefully I didn't talk too fast. You can find me um, at Twitter, at John Young. And yeah, I'm not sure if there's any questions, but I guess we'll end it there. Let's see if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, we have the questions open. Uh, we have one comment and one question. The question, well, the comment first. It will be very cool to see all of this. I'm also a Riz who's also started in Elixir a few months ago. And the question will be, what will be your next deep dive? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, well, there's been a bunch of stuff with live view. So this is potentially not uh, Elixir specific, but there's been a bunch of stuff with live view that I'm super excited to do a deep dive on. I've also got a Raspberry Pi um, that I really want to load up nerves on. So a lot of fun stuff with Elixir. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we have a couple more of more comments. Thanks for the reference to Margaret. I, I've been quite wanting this uh, and great talk. Oh, thank you. So seems like we are not getting more questions. Um, there's nothing left to say that. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for giving your talk and contact him if you have any other questions that you couldn't make here, please. Yeah, yeah just reach me out on Twitter. Thank All you, right, Jonathan. Thanks. Thank you.